Happy 2023, everybody. We're starting off season three with our first ever guest voice on Dudes of the Dead, fellow lit teacher and friend of the pod, Jennifer Nargang. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. Happy to be jump here. Jump scare, Jen. Yeah, jump, jump scare, scare, Jen. Jump scare, Jen, okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot the nickname. Um, thank you for being with us and for sharing your thoughts today. Uh, before we get into our discussion of Alex Garland's Men, can you tell us a little bit about maybe your history with horror films and how you actually came to watch this specific film. Sure. So uh, this specific film was sheer peer pressure from Mike. Um, <laughs> yeah. As only Mike can and, do it. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I, actually, the irony that I'm here is not lost on me because I am not a horror movie there buff. You go. Um, so very out of character for me to watch a horror film. Hereditary um, is your favorite one? Hereditary. Yeah, still, still have not brought <laughs> myself to watch Hereditary. But no, I just had some, uh, some residual trauma, I would say, from, you know, watching horror movies too young at sleepovers and being the one next to the window and Fair. not being able to fall asleep. Yeah. So, yeah. I have a memory of having a discussion with you. Was it Session 9? Like session really freaked nine. you out? Ooh, that one, yes. Is still. that what turns you off horror movies kind of when you stopped? You know, it was actually that one was trying to power through and watch more. But I, I think at a too early age, like at eight or nine, I watched Candyman and that Ooh. scarred me, mm. yeah. scarred me. And then Scream. Um, I remember as a kid, like looking out my bedroom window at night, thinking that Scream guy would be running across and coming into my window. So, yeah, I'm just not not the type of personality that holds well with Fair. horror. <laughs> But this one actually not so not so bad. It's not it's not in the same realm as the ones you're talking about. Exactly. Um, I mean, you know, um, we can talk about Alex Garland's other stuff, but I mean, it's certainly not 28 days later. Anyway, we'll get into that. Um, Mike, do you want to introduce the film? Sure. Yeah. So as Leatherface Lee said, today we're taking a look at Alex Garland's Men. Uh, and Alex Garland has directed other prominent films such as Ex Machina and Annihilation and was also a writer for 28 Days Later. Um, so Men stars Jesse Buckley as Harper and Rory Kinnear as pretty much every other character in the movie. <laughs> and we'll get to that uh, when we get into our discussion. So a synopsis for Men. Uh, seeking refuge and solace after a horrifying loss, traumatized Harper flees London and holes in a secluded manner in the idyllic English countryside. But healing, like change, takes time, and haunted by painful memories and unbearable guilt, Harper thirsts for redemption. However, a brief exploration of the lush local landscape reveals strange happenings as uncomfortable encounters thwart Harper's ambitious plans to bounce back. So, yeah, we also brought Jen on for this episode, partly because of the controversial subject matter. Uh, and obviously, the title says it all. This is a film about men. So we felt having two men discuss the film might be uh, a bit shallow. So to have a more rich discourse, we thought having a female voice might be helpful. Um, so Unlike all of our other discussions, which are so deep and meaningful, <laughs> exactly, yeah. it would be shallow just to have us talk about it. So we'll it. just bring back Jen for every episode. <laughs> exactly. Diversity. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and so... Do we want to start? Actually, we'll say uh, got 6.1 on Internet Movie Database yeah. and 68% on Rotten Tomatoes. Hmm. Uh, for the critic score, the Correct. Au audience score 37? was 39. 39. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. So a bit of a disconnect between, and mm -hmm. that's not surprising to me, between audience and critics. No, not at all. Uh, well, particularly because of how the movie plays out, I can, I mean, as a, I thinking like a critic, I, I would say, oh, okay, well, I can see what's happening here and all the stuff that Alex Garland is doing. And the performances, in in my view, but as a as a movie goer, if you were going in, even like to me, it's it is a little bit surprising only because if you had seen Annihilation, which kind of comes out of left field in in some ways, um, I would say, oh well, Alex Garland, like he doesn't always do straight ahead sort of stuff. So, but this you is, and I saw Ex Mach and I think in theaters together, if I recall. Maybe. I've definitely seen it. I don't remember where. Yeah, we've seen Annihilation. Have yeah. you seen Ex Machina or no, Annihilation? Okay. Nothing else. I mean, Annihilation is very in line, I think, with this film yes. in yeah. terms of style. I think yeah. Ex Machina is a little more accessible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I was thinking, do we want to start with the title? Like, even the title Men, Yes. I think, serves a bit of a function in terms of how it sets up its audience. Um, what were your takeaways from the audience? And maybe, Jen, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, well, uh, actually, I'm associating the title with the... Um, picturing like the cover of the I don't know you can't call it DVD anymore but yeah. the cover for the movie because I kind of like it's like how I buy wine I buy it by the label you look at the label yeah, on a yeah. movie and yeah just that bold red lettering imprinted on 
the character Jeffrey's face, right? And um, over his eyes, which I thought was really interesting. But um, yeah, so I, I guess I was expecting, obviously, some some topic around gender, uh, something going on there. And then um, just with the blaring red letters and, and the way that it actually took away from his eyes, I was thinking that maybe men in this movie are going to be quite like generic or stereotyped, hmm. less individualized in some way. And that's you were pretty, pretty bang on. I pretty, think, I some, think that's kind of what came true. Yeah. Like, do you think he's trying to put male viewers on the defensive? Cause it's almost like men, this is the title. Like you almost, it's almost like a trap. Like it, given the themes he's going to be exploring, does that almost put men in a position where they're coming into the film already on a defensive position? So that's interesting. I'll, I'll jump into this because I had a question that, to throw out to, to us because one of the things I wondered after I saw the film was what, what's his intention um, as a director and a writer? Are we seeing Harper's view of men mm -hmm. after her trauma? Are we experiencing, or is Alex Garland suggesting this is men? Uh, is it a mix of those kind of things or is there something else going on? Cause to, to me, I mean, one, one, one interpretation would be at least uh, as I watched it the, the first and second time was this is Harper's external view of men after the trauma she experiences with her husband. And we're seeing all of those individual components of men, the moral man, the child, um, the authority figure with the, like all of those different things she's seeing. She's seeing that, but is that, is he saying that's what men are or is he just suggesting that this is Harper's view? And my follow-up to that is, is that his story to tell, which I was really mm. interested in your opinion on, but I'll, I'll throw it back to you guys. Do you want to go first? Yeah, uh, sure. I, I definitely picked up also on that idea of like, there's multiple iterations of, of men here, like that more childlike boy who just wants a woman's attention or love and like a spend time with me, play with me type of way. Yeah. And then there's the more uh, like caretaking man. Like that's how I saw Jeffrey almost like fatherly. Yeah. Like I, I will bring in your luggage from the car for yeah. you. I will check around the house to make sure it's safe. Um, and, but I did not see it as through Harper's eyes, she was seeing those versions of men. I saw that as like an external, those versions of men were being almost okay. forced onto her. Yeah. Um, even when she, there's that one scene where she enters the local pub and it does a shot from these two guys sitting at a table and they're watching her enter. So mm. I was seeing it more of like the, per the perspective of how men see women and then how she is then seeing those men. But oh, to me, it was, it was the male gaze first. Cause she makes no comment that every man looks the same and it's no, Rory no, Kinnear's no. character. So obviously it seems that that is intended for the viewer, but yeah. she's not actually seeing all men in that way. No, she's not. I mean, cause that's a, that's a, an important difference. I think so. I don't think there's, at least I don't take away anything from the film of all men are the same, but I think he, um, by having all men look the same, yes. I think he invites a very simplistic reading, which I think a lot of people will take away from this film. If you're not willing to sit there and grapple with it, your average moviegoer who goes in, sees the title, sees that every man looks the yeah. same, men being portrayed in negative light, unfortunately, I think probably invites that reading from a lot of viewers. I, I think you're right. And I think that's borne out in the in the audience, um, 39%, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, and, and I think it's unfortunate, and I don't know if this is you know, the audience is, we don't know if that's a, a, a male, female breakdown, but I can see men being defensive. I can also see women go, oh, that's not what men are like. But what I loved about the film was exactly those things of, I like your, um, Jen, your, your view of Jeffrey as sort of the father figure, because I had him as, you know, sort of helpful, but awkward. Mm. Um, he's trying to do his best in the only way he knows how. Uh, given the age gap and all the rest of it. And that's how he approaches women. Right. We're not um, too deep in yet, but just a uh, warning for our viewers, this will be full spoilers. Yeah, so, so before so we start yeah. talking about deeper things, yeah. I meant to mention that. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, See I think, late. is he, um, cause the very, at the very beginning of the film, when she arrives at the manor, she picks an apple off the tree mm -hmm, and eats it. Mm -hmm. And there's even like a direct reference to like the forbidden fruit. So yeah, clearly mm -hmm. I think he's looking more at the like patriarchal, and 
um, like misogyny built into institutions and built into religion. Like religion is clearly a very big theme in this film. I don't know if he's necessarily saying all men are this way, but men have kind of become this way because of this long generation mm. of misogyny and patriarchy. Because even Jeffrey's character, he seems like a well-meaning person, totally. but he says things that are almost um, expected of men in society. Like he grabs her bags and he's mm -hmm. um, implying that she should have a husband, but he's not mean-spirited, at least for the first half of the film. But he has inherited these yeah. um, positions that are as a result of, in many cases, like religious um, traditions and uh, the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Do you think? Well, we uh, the other we can jump into this too because I think there's an interesting dichotomy between uh, that organized religion with the vicar and the the um, sort of Celtic pagan side of things with the green man. And I think I, I think I'm pronouncing this right. The Sheila and the gig. Sheila and the gig. Yeah. Um, and that's the the um, female symbology, Celtic yeah. symbology that they focus on, right? So there's uh, to me, it just seemed like there was. Um, there was that side of thing, the fertility, um, uh, pagan side of things. And then the established Adam and Eve, Apple, that, that whole, I mean, it's like, it, he slaps you in the face with that yeah. one right off the bat. Right. Um, and I, I just think I, I, again, it's interesting too, with Jeffrey's character in particular, because of his age and he sort of forces his way of the world upon her. That's what he's asking us to grapple with. And I, I think you're, you're very right, Mike, about him. It's almost too simplistic. If you're not willing to grapple, if you're not yeah. willing to, to dig a little bit, there's this, the veneer is very simplistic. There's mm -hmm. the Adam and Eve, there's men and women, but there's so much more underneath that, that he's asking us to think about and how do we interact with the world? How do we see one another? Right. Cause I didn't really like the film the first time, but I appreciate it a lot more the second time. Yeah, and you only watched it once, but what was your kind of initial gut takeaway? I, I liked it, but I think that's because I went in analytically. So I was looking for things, right? Yeah. And I think when you when you go in with that point of view, there's lots to pick apart. And so, like, it kept me up the night after I watched it, not out of fear, surprisingly, <laughs> but more out of like really mulling over what was he what was he saying with this film and and what was going on. Um, but it's funny, Lee, because you were um, talking about like the, just the awkwardness of Jeffrey and, and I picked up on him as the father figure. And, and I think through his character and through multiple others, there's definitely these men that are trying to figure out like, oh, just a woman, the mm -hmm. workings of a woman, what, how women want to be treated, what they really want and what motivates them. And I almost took pity on the male characters because they can't figure that out yeah. and they have diff difficulty expressing what they want and need as well. Like that, the final line, basically, I think that's spoken in the movie is, is, uh, her asking her husband yes. when he comes back, like, what, what do you want from me or what do you want? And he just says, I love, yeah. I want to yeah. be loved. And it's so simple, really what the men are asking for and what the men need. Um, but in this film, she's kind of incapable of giving that to them or she's not reacting in the way they expect. Mm -hmm. Can I push back a little bit sure. on that and yeah, just say, yeah. There isn't it. There isn't a man in the movie that asks her though, what she needs or what she wants. No, I guess they right? have their so, assumptions though. So they're trying to figure out what she wants, but they never actually ask her. Yeah, right? They're point. from their own perspective. Oh, what would this person want? And, I, and I'm not suggesting that I'm successful at this, but to me, that was the obvious thing. Is like, well, you're not interact. You're not engaging with her as another human being. Mm. You're just making assumptions about. I'll buy your drink, I'll bring in your bags, I'll protect you, I'll do all these things. Uh, and it seemed to me that the men in the film, but they all come across as very selfish. The child is petulant and selfish. I, I want this from you. Mm -hmm. The vicar is selfish and makes assumptions about, well, do, you know, did you drive him to do what he did and, and those right. things, right? And then there's Jeffrey's character who makes assumptions. There's the cop who makes assumptions. I mean, one of the things that came up in my mind was appropriation. Mm. And that's why I asked the question about, is this Alex Garland's story to tell? Right. How much do we, and, and to be completely transparent, I'm, I'm not, I don't buy into the appropriation. Fiction is fiction. And that's the whole point of fiction is that you can tell a story from somebody else's perspective. Mm -hmm. Now you might get it wrong, but that's okay. Because then you engage in a dialogue and say, hmm, I don't think you got that right. How about you ask 
you know, in this case, a female's perspective about what that might be like. Do you agree with that? Because that seems to be a big uh, controversy in lit. Right. No, I, I totally agree. I, I agree that uh, any story can be anyone's to tell, but they could fail miserably mm-hmm. in the attempt at telling that story. Yeah. But- and I think you need to be upfront that if he took on like a, a woman's name as the director of the film pretending, I think that would be a problem. But as long as you're upfront about who you are, um, like if you were writing a book about an indigenous female character sure, sure. and you made a pen name that was seemingly would fit that character, then that would be a problem. But if you're Joe Blow and you're writing that, then fair enough. From my perspective, yeah. I mean, if you're disingenuous about what position you're coming from, if you if you have a name that doesn't seem to be male or female, you know, that's androgynous and you're you're coming across as maybe a different gender or a different perspective. But yeah, I agree with both of you. But does it diminish the 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 power of the message? So if this was a female director, would it carry more weight than coming? It's a movie about men, but then it's directed by a man. So does that take away from the S- message at all? See, I, I did zero research on this movie. I just watched it as I was told. <laughs> and um, I that was one of the things I was wondering afterwards is, is this a male or female director? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. and who wrote this script? And I thought it's actually quite well done. I think it's a, it's a very sympathetic outlook on women and women's yeah. experiences because really what I kept thinking about is seeing this is that this like poor character is getting blame from all of these different men mm. that she's encountering. And, and I thought from a male's perspective, it was quite enlightened in, in the female experience. And just when you think about this history of blame, if you go all back to the fall of Eden mm. and that blame that women have carried on their shoulders and how it's still manifesting, I thought it was a really interesting topic and, and idea for a male director to explore. And that seems to be a central theme in the film, like her trying to use her voice and it's always being prevented by men. And even because Harper means musician, Mm -hmm. literally one who plays the harp. But it's interesting because he at the beginning says like, oh, do you play piano? She's like, no. But then she plays the piano brilliantly later. And in the tunnel, when she starts singing. Yes. uh, And then that is interrupted by the naked dude at the end. Oh, no, is he naked at that point? Was he? I thought he was clothed. I saw a flapping jacket. I think so, yeah. He could have been the vicar then. It could have been because based I, on the clothing. I thought it was the green man as well. And then I thought, no, that the silhouette isn't right for mm-hmm. somebody with no clothes on. Yeah. And then she screams out in yes. the church and um, the vicar shows up He's at that there. point. Yeah. And I guess because the vicar makes a reference to the um, like Ulysses and the siren. Did yes. you pick mm-hmm. up on that? And that's mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. When and it, so that story is about like the the sirens like tempting. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so interesting that when she uses her voice. Uh, and he blames her well, again, yes. talking about uh, blame. The reason that he's attracted to her and tempted to her, she's like the siren who's, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I found it. Sorry. No, no, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. but the, that particular scene in the tunnel was like really moving for me, and the the focus I think on like the dripping and the water, and that's obviously creating the echo and and why she's able to do that. But that idea that she is just trying to express her voice in that scene, yes. she's experimenting. She is not trying to entrance a man, but then at the end of the tunnel, a man shows up and just starts running towards yes. her. Right. So it, definitely that whole mm-hmm. siren song thing uh there's like a whole sexual component to that especially if it is the vicar because of course later he shows up and says like by merely existing you're you're seducing me essentially so uh yeah that scene was really cool with the with the ties to the whole siren song and then there's the like you brought up a harper player of the harp but there's also like the harpy um meaning behind that right and that whole scene with the raven with the woman's mask on top right like a female head with the body of a bird there's there's a ton to pick apart there was something about that and yeah. I didn't get it at the time but thank you for for bringing that up and the, the tunnel scene just before we get off that topic I mean one of the things that um that you touched on Jen that I really liked was to me I saw it as and and I think you can see this on Harper's face she, it's just this childlike joy of express uh, expressing her voice and then there's menace when you mm. see the man at the end of the tunnel and then when he starts running towards her. And I just thought, again, this is that, that brief scene encapsulates, I think the um, one of the possible messages of the film. And that is when a woman is trying to express her voice, when she's just uh, being herself and, and, ex- and having joy in the world, it's fucked up <laughs> by the presence of a man. And, and, not even, even if he hadn't run towards her, mm-hmm. just 
the the silhouette of a man, just the idea that he's there introduces menace and the potential for harm, right? And she's trying to use her voice with the police officer to say, like, I'm in danger. Yes. Uh, yeah, please do something about this yeah. guy. And they just ignore her. Yeah. So, yeah. and this is where I think the film gets complicated. There's a lot of different kind of themes and motifs that I feel kind of get muddied a little bit. Because one of the themes seems to be she's also trying to recover from trauma, right? Yes. So she's had this traumatic thing. Uh, there's themes of rebirth, I think, with the Green Man and the Sheila Nagig. And so could you see that tunnel as she's almost trying to like heal from her become reborn going through the sort of birth canal and coming out the other end? But mm. she can't because there's a man on the other side preventing her from doing that. So I, I think it's fair to read in this kind of rebirth oh, motif sure. because of the Sheila Nagig and the Green Man. But then that starts to muddy the waters if we're just looking at a gender commentary. And there's also a lot about religion as well. Oh, hundred mm. percent. And I almost feel like he maybe went too far in trying to introduce too many elements that start to maybe muddy the water and become a little bit confusing. And there was the decomposing deer as well. Right. And they make a reference to rebirth and they mm. zoom in through the eye socket of the deer and then mm. zoom back out and it's decomposed. So it seems like, and actually, I think something you said about what Grant had said when he watched this film. But is this a story more about her wanting to overcome trauma? Some people talked about the five stages of grief yeah, and yeah. that she's doing that. Or is it a commentary about men in society? Or is it a critique of religion? And there's a lot going on. And I don't know if they always work out perfectly. Yeah. My initial reaction to that is um, if we if we talked or if you mentioned um the possibility of a of a, a a too simplistic view of men, but now you're saying it's too complex. When no, you, I'm just saying uh, there's a danger of yeah, okay, of taking a simplistic view if you just say, oh, hey, all these guys look the same. Yeah, I don't think that's the case because I think when you really dive into it, yes. there's a lot going on. But you have to really dig to. Most people aren't thinking on that level. No, and especially I, if you don't go into the film expecting to think on that level. And I, th I just wonder. Are, are those things not inextricable? So when you talk about the Celtic elements and, and the rebirth stuff and the religious part of it and the grief and her, like, aren't all of those things, how would you extricate those things from one another? Like, aren't they all, aren't they all happening all at the same time always? But I guess if your message is, Religion and the patriarchy is the reason that women are suppressed. How does the green man who is supposed to symbolize rebirth and who's a pagan symbol, like how does he play? Because that kind of muddies the water if your commentary is religious institutions. Yeah, I can see that. Like they almost seem at odds with each other. Like they're not consistent in terms of the green man. Is he even a threat in the film? Like she sees him as a threat, but maybe if he represents nature and actually all the times where she is happy and flourishing is very crisp, green, uh, mm. bright green colors. And every time she's in a building or there's like, I almost saw it as institutions was red because inside of the building yes. is all red when she is being like the lighting when she's interacting with James is red. Mm -hmm. But then when she's out in nature, that seems to be when she's herself and happy and it's yeah, really green. Yeah. She's out in the forest. So how does the green man play into that? Is she, does she learn to not actually become afraid of him? The threat isn't the green man. The threat is these other characters. I still see the green man as a threat. Yeah, I too. think when he, well, he first of all materializes in, in a very threatening way, right? He's just there. And then th there's something that really sits with you when you see like a full frontal male totally. dude, yeah. right? So he's very, like, it's almost violating in a way his presence and he's just there bearing all and, and she just has to see that. So I saw him as another threatening figure for sure. Totally. And I agree, but that's where it seems to be contradictory because if he represents rebirth mm -hmm. and she wants to be reborn from coming through this trauma, then should he not be th a threatening idea symbolically? Isn't it all the other, the institutions and religion and men that is the thing obstructing her from achieving her goal? Well, I guess I, the, the thing that the thought that comes to my mind is, isn't the fact that he's a male just the very fact that he exists is a threat to her. I mean, if, if we look at her inside the house, she's come to the country to overcome the, or, or as part of the overcoming of, of the grief, it's rebirth. I mean, maybe another way to look at, look at that is if you're inside the house and you've got those red walls, is that her in the womb? Is that her mm -hmm. trying to, to 
regenerate herself. And then when he sticks his hand through the mail slot, is that not him? To me, that was a direct threat. Now, there are other ways of interpreting that. Maybe he's reaching out to her, but it doesn't seem that way when you've got a locked door and he's thrusting his hand. If you do that womb interpretation, Mm -hmm. he's thrusting his hand in there almost, well, certainly without invitation. And I don't know if you noticed that the, the injury that, that she inflicts sure. on him yeah. is the same as her husband. Yes, mm-hmm. um, definitely. Yeah, I guess it's interesting though, then why choose the green man as your symbol that you're alluding to when, given well, what he represents, seems like an odd, like going with the vicar makes perfect sense because he seems to be attacking religion. Right. So right. as a pagan character, it just seems a bit odd to me. And I, at first I wasn't even sure because he's, never quite directly threatening her. Like he's in the background and he's standing mm-hmm, there, mm-hmm. but it seems to be the other iterations of the character that are preventing her voice or coming after her. And he maybe seems threatening on the surface, but maybe actually isn't. I don't know. Well, is it possible that Garland's maybe suggesting that, that that green man character, that that pagan element is not as innocuous as the assumptions that we make about, is he deliberately conflating the idea of organized religion and pagan religion as saying, "Mm, maybe our understandings of pagan religion and what the green man represents is not as favorable as we might think. That's Um, possible. Right. But when you, if you just look up the record, like what the green man represents, it's rebirth. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, I felt that's what she was trying to achieve. So it's just interesting that that was also the threat, I guess. But I mean, and to be fair, the the scores and some of the reviews kind of suggest as well that perhaps he didn't achieve his complete goal of maybe what he was going for. I think that's probably fair. Like, I, I think um, there's, a, there's a lot going on. This is about grief and religion and relationships and gender and fertility and all of these things. What is he asking me to think about? What is he asking me to come away from? I mean, it's certainly one of my questions for Jen was... What do you think Garland wants us to walk away from this film understanding? Oh, maybe maybe there's not one thing, but like what what did you come away from the film with an understanding of? Um, to me, I think maybe there was some intent to perhaps show or bring to light for a male audience in particular the 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 blame that's put on women. That's kind of what I walked away with. And to maybe um, really introspectively look at how you speak to and how you view women and and maybe see if that aligns with one of the characters or you can see yourself in one mm-hmm. of those characters and start to do a bit of self-reflection. I don't know. Like there's obviously a female audience for this. And I like as a female viewer, I wasn't sure what I was really meant to okay. take away. Because you would already far. know all of those things. That It was almost reaffirming yeah, in viewing yeah, it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. What about, what do you think Garland wants us to take away? Yeah, I think I would agree with that for the most part. I do think that's what he's going for. I just felt like he's clearly taking shots at religion. Because um, sure. I think the whole original sin, the Garden of Eden, um, the vicar, uh, even like James, the, her husband, some people said that could be like the King James Bible. Mm. Um, oh, so that there's actually a lot of religious um, symbology and iconography in the film. Even the way her husband looks when he falls yeah. on the ground is very Christ-like. Yeah, yeah. And he's got like, his hand is pierced yeah. and his feet are broken. Like yeah. that's a very Christ-like um the way he's situated on the, it's not a cross, but it's yeah, yeah. the thing. So yeah, I, I feel like he's saying the power differential and the blame that women have in society now is as a result of this long history right. of right. Uh, religious control. And I think that's where he's saying this all starts with religion, the reason that we have this gender imbalance. And I kind of felt like maybe he was saying, because there's all the nature and that's where she seems happy mm-hmm. that like, we should be equal, but religion has created this atmosphere where right. that we have this imbalance. And so he's trying to, I think, as Jen said, trying to make the male audience see that. But I saw this as like a pretty scathing attack on religion. I mean, you have to see it that way, oh, right? With I, the Garden of Eden, like no, that no, is so sure. clear. He's definitely taking, I, I totally agree with you. I was just uh, grappling with something. Sorry, I kind of got off on a tangent in my mind and I, kinda, I was <laughs> thinking okay. about her husband and one of the things I wondered was, was it necessary 
at the beginning. They're obviously not getting along. She says, you know, I'm going to divorce you and so on. Did he, did he need to have that scene with the domestic violence in order to hit home? Like to me, that was, I'm questioning it because I'm wondering, like, couldn't you have a disagreement, an end of a relationship without her having to have a reason, quote unquote, to leave him? I mean, he's controlling, he grabs her phone, he's, you know, questioning her. And then he it looked to me like a full on punch. It wasn't a slap. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And so to me, that was like, okay, well, there's absolutely no question there. Whereas, I, so sure, it's definitive. But couldn't you have done it where it's just over? It's like, we're not, this isn't working out and I'm done and achieve the same results. Like, I, I guess I questioned, was that a little bit of cheating to make it seem like she had to do what she did? Mm. And that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just done and it's over. Yeah, that's a good question. Like to me, that the punching scene is obviously the catalyst. Like yeah. it, it makes her mind up and then her making her mind up is what makes him go to the yes. floor above and, and do what he does. So, um, yeah, I, the, the inclusion of that scene though, like, is it necessary? That's a good question. Why isn't it just enough for her to make a decision yeah. with the lack? Like if we're that? talking about just, if we're talking about women and their voice, mm-hmm. isn't it enough for her to say, I'm actually done. I don't need a reason. Interesting too, that, uh, when he's falling, she's trying to scream or you yes. see her speak, you yeah. can't hear her voice. So yes. I think that's interesting. Or was it just to make him seem that unhinged? Yeah. I mean, there's, right. there's other like the fact ways. that he's willing to jump off a building and kill himself. That's another indicator that this guy is like mentally unstable. We said spoilers. But I really also thought it was interesting. There's that one part where I think it's when she's like telling the vicar what happened and it's a question of did he actually intentionally jump or did he slip? Because she said yes. he he climbed up with the intention of just climbing down right. onto their balcony and he slipped and that's what happened. So that whole question of what was the motivation there, was there a motivation or was See, it accidental? I, to me, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. There, the, He does present it almost as a question, but I never believed that she believed that. Mm. I, like when I see that scene, I'm like, yeah, that's a bit of rationalization to, to help remove any any guilt that she might have about his intention because it's very clear before that this is what I'm going to do mm-hmm. if you divorce me. So it's like, was it really a question or is that just her trying to assuage her, her any possible, I'm not saying she should feel guilty, but maybe that she did. Mm-hmm. And the vicar certainly doesn't help by saying, <laughs> no. Oh, well maybe if you'd let him apologize and let him back in that none of that would have happened. Right. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a bit unfortunate that the, having him want to manipulate her or else would commit suicide. Like, I wouldn't necessarily see that as a male tactic. Like, I think every other, all the other men in the, in the film do things that are kind of characteristic of men mm-hmm. to do to women. Mm-hmm. But uh, I would see that more as like, that's a very like borderline personality thing. Like someone who's like so attached to someone and they're threatened to kill themselves or something if they don't, mm-hmm. which actually has a 75% prevalence rate in women more than men. So I would have thought maybe they could have chosen, they could have almost just stuck with the domestic violence right, perhaps right. or had another. Um, I don't know clinically what, what that would be, but I certainly don't feel that that's a male trait. I've, I've certainly not myself personally, but known people who've had that happen. Well, if you break up with me, this is For what sure, I yeah. do, right? Mm-hmm. And so I don't think it's a male. Because it kind of paints. I mean, he's painting with pretty broad strokes here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to kind of say, like, is this another male behavior, which I don't know if I would agree with. Mm-hmm. Whereas everything else I thought was good. One thought I was curious to get your opinion on, there's a female police officer. Yes. Right. And I thought that was kind of interesting because every character in that village is that one is Rory Kinnear's character. Yeah. That had to be deliberate. Like, I th- what's your take on why have one female character mm-hmm. who's an authority figure as well and is that to put some blame on some women as well? Because she says, I think, oh, I don't, we've checked him out. I don't think he's, he's really a threat. Mm-hmm. So she's on the same side as the mm-hmm. other men in the village, but she's not a man. So did you pick up on that? And do you have an interpretation of that? Maybe she's representative of uh, like a female character that is not carrying male trauma, right? Mm. Harper is very traumatized yeah. by what's happened. Yeah. And, and maybe that's showing her biased outlook where we have another woman who does not have that same bias. To play devil's advocate, there's also the, I think what you're suggesting is that that she's the female who who protects men and who goes along with the male dominant theory yeah. uh, or or the or the patriarchy 
Um, and again, I think that's more evidence for this is perhaps societal, mm -hmm. like structural. So like this authority of, it's more the the institutions that we've created yeah. that are created by men through, I think, religion, even though women can participate in those institutions. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting, because I, I mean, it makes total sense to me that you've got, you know, the police, which is a paramilitary yeah. organization. And the church. Yeah, and the, and, and that the, the police are, until very, very recently, created by men, run by men, pretty much, well, I won't say pre for men. So that's a very interesting... Because she's a, she's a total outlier because every other character, yes. I think that, I don't think she encounters, other than her friend on the phone mm -hmm. who's back home, I think everyone she encounters in that village is Rory Kinnear, an iteration of that. She is sympathetic to mm -hmm. Harper, but she also toes the male line, yes. right? She's like, I don't think he's, you don't have to worry about him. He's not a threat exactly. or something, I think yeah. is what she said. Now, so so the only other character in the film is Harper's close friend. Riley? I, it, I think yeah. so. Sounds right. And that, and so she FaceTimes with her and she's the one who ends up arriving at the end. And you don't know until the end that she's pregnant. Yeah. Which I missed the shows, first time I watched it. Yes. I was like, oh, that's super interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that was very interesting to me when, when she shows up and, and she's, you know, pregnant. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay. I, and I don't know what to take away from that I, other than the cycle continues, right? Well, well, that's kind of the irony that this whole patriarchal cycle and rebirth requires women like it, a woman has to be there to you know give birth to more men to perpetuate these uh and i think that's why that the presence of the kind of boyish character really struck me because he also even though he's a child he's also representative of kind of like an institutional ideal that is passed down mm -hmm. as well right because he's saying like play with me and yeah. as soon as she says i i, I don't want to do that right now yeah. like i'm saying no to you he says bitch yeah right totally. so she's yeah. not willing to give this child the time as like a motherly figure yeah. and and how so, did you read the mask because the kid's wearing a mask that's also interesting and that's another representation of a female right because it's that blonde mm -hmm. like red lipstick or is it that mask. men can pretend to be not threatening but deep inside behind the mask we're all like the vicar or jeffrey or the green man right that's interesting because he comes across well very creepy mm -hmm. is how he comes across but when she first sees him it's less threatening than when he takes the mask off yeah right and that's um, when he kind of turns on her right yes mm -hmm. when she refuses to play with him is that when he takes off the mask yes, like yes. and well and he's like initially he, there's it seems to me that he's a little bit shy or whatever and then he asks for what he wants, but when she doesn't give it to him, um, then then he's then he turns on her, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I definitely, I mean, to me, that's a very obvious, like that's that childlike part of men that, well, if you don't do what I'm asking you to do, then somehow you're against me or you're a bitch is the word that he right. uses, right? Should we talk about the climax? The well, I was just gonna say, we've been avoiding <laughs> the birthing of men um, <laughs> at the end of the film. it's a somewhat normal movie until that point. And they're like, wow, what yeah. is going on here? And I think that will make or break this film for a lot of people probably. Uh, maybe Jen, you could describe kind of what happens in detail. Oh, 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 just so, yeah. <laughs> leave it to the guests oh, thanks, to do the thank hard you. part. Please paint us a picture of what happens in that scene. Well, there's this. I think it, an important scene right before that as well is she has this encounter with Jeffrey, yes. and she's essentially chased, hunted down in yep. her own car, um, and then that crashes. And then, forgive me, I'm trying to remember the order because I feel like the the sequence of who gives birth to whom is possibly. So important. I think it's the green man, green man boy. First vicar, the boy, first the vicar. Jeffrey, James, I think. James. I think that's okay. right. Yeah. Okay. And five stages of grief. There's five things. I think that's kind I of never, interesting. I never interesting. thought to notice the order. That's very interesting. Yeah. Well, I when we we're about on the second or third labor scene, I figured, <laughs> okay, like this is going to end in her husband. I, right. I, you know that's what's coming, but I didn't know if there was any meaning behind the order. But essentially, um, the green man begins and gives birth in a very traditional way. <laughs> and then like an another male comes out. So it's just like male upon male being birthed in order. Um, but then the labor changes because it goes from like a 
can I say vaginal mm-hmm. labor, to then uh, a labor out of the back and then yeah. a labor out of the mouth yeah. and feet first. So it kind of is morphing as it goes on. And I think at first Harper's like horrified by what she's seeing in front of her. And then by the end, and I think as a viewer too, you just kind of, it's almost normalized. Yeah. And she's just watching like what is coming. So seeing her um, change at, throughout that scene is interesting as well. But yeah, the the male birth scene. Way to hit that one out of the park. Yeah, that was way. good. That was, yeah. A good job. Yeah. So do we see this film more as a psychological journey of Harper trying to overcome trauma or is it more of a societal critique of men or is it both? Because it's interesting, the fifth stage of grief is acceptance Mm -hmm. and James is the final iteration and she's not scared anymore. She's kind of just like, okay, like this is it. And I was trying to, when I was looking at the five stages and looking at those five characters to see if they kind of symbolize the traits Mm. of like uh, anger and um, denial. And maybe you can read it that way. I don't know for sure, but. I think some people feel that this film, like all these characters are in her head Mm -hmm. and this is like her psychological demon. She's battling to like come out the other end. But I don't know. Because is that, do you say what Grant's takeaway was from this? Yeah, it's because I watched this with my partner. And so he, like he basically left with, and this was pre the birth scene. We paused halfway through to grab some snacks and uh, we had watched the tunnel scene. And he said, you know, like there's nothing scary about this film. Mm -hmm. He's like, she's just going for a walk and she just sees another person. Like there's no reason to be afraid of that. But then she turns and runs in fear. So he, he was of the mind that everything is in her head and we're seeing everything in this biased view Mm -hmm. because any other normal person would not be threatened by the presence of a stranger, but she is. So what symbolically, how do you guys read the the birthing? Uh, well, I, I like what you said. I mean, I don't think it reads exactly. Like, I don't think it tracks exactly. But I do think what, what resonates with me is acceptance with James as the last one. And particularly because she seems at peace. Exactly. At the end when her friend arrives. And she's just like... Okay. And even, even in the scene with James, when he says, all I want is love, mm-hmm. like when, or when she asks, what, what do you want from me? She seen that her body language seems to exude a, a peaceful acceptance of this is okay. I get it. This is where we're at. Um, but I don't know, like, for example, the green man being the first one, I don't know where that fits in with anger. So I don't know if it tracks exactly. Yeah. Right. And like, is it from paganism? Then like the vicars in the middle, then it's religion. And then maybe the hope is that we can come out of this eventually. Well, we haven't even, and I don't know that there's anything to this. We haven't even talked about the interracial aspect of their <laughs> relationship, right? That's so true. let's not, let's not open up that Pandora's box. No, maybe box. not. Um, Sorry, Jen, did you? Well, I was just going to say that in the sequence, this thing that the thing that stuck out to me the most was Jeffrey just sobbing and he was the second to last one. And he was just looking at her and just, you know, so upset and crying. And that part was the most meaningful to me for some reason. So I don't know if that fits into your stages. Um, I, I should have written them down. I didn't, unfortunately, but ridiculous. Yeah. it might. I think I, I was trying to track them all. Let me just do that. Actually, you guys keep talking. Do you do you think you mentioned... Um, the 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 way the birthing happens. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's anything I hadn't thought about that until you mentioned it? And do you think that there's anything to that? Like, do you think um, that it starts off with the green man being a traditional vaginal birth, right. and then it goes to these other ways? Is, is there? S- had you thought about that? Was there something to that? I I really didn't know. Um, I know that. Well, like. F- Head first is what you want, right? right? That's the most natural, easiest, easiest yeah. birthing quote. <laughs> um, quote. And then feet first is how James comes, but then it's through the mouth. So I really, I, I <laughs> didn't, I could not interpret that part. Okay. Okay. Sure. Fascinating. So okay. the fifth one is acceptance, which we said is James. Right. You were saying how much he was just crying and upset. Fourth one is depression. Hmm. And then the third one is bargaining. And I think when you look at the conversation the vicar has with her on the bench, that idea of bargaining about how much of it is her own guilt versus uh, his guilt. So I think maybe that fits. Well, even him bargaining his own desires Mm -hmm. versus his moral obligation to be an... an, The kid, number two, is anger. And he gets mad at her for not playing the game. And then the first one is denial, which would be the green man. Hmm. I'm not sure exactly how that fits, but that's pretty fascinating. And even you saying before that how upset he yeah. was and how much he's crying mm-hmm. depression. That actually, I mean, I'll take my, I'll retract my statement because that actually does track pretty close. To, it totally to does, which stages, is actually right? really mm-hmm. shocking given everything we just said. Yeah. Wow. Can, can we address like, I think kind of an unspoken thing that in that final scene with friend shows up, there's blood. 
there's the damaged car still. So if you're making the argument yes. that perhaps like this is all taking place in her mind, then whose blood is that? Yeah. Did this happen? How did the car get damaged? Well, that's where my criticism comes in a little bit because I feel like he's brought in all these really fascinating elements and you can kind of see where they all kind of fit in the film, but I don't know if they all do kind of come together in this perfect cohesive whole. Like, I think that would have been a cool approach to take, but as you say, well, the car's damaged, so this couldn't have just been in her head. Like, clearly, was Jeffrey physically driving around trying to kill mm -hmm. her in this car? So I'm not sure. Part of me, it feels like it just didn't quite come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or is he clever enough to just leave some openings? Like, okay, so as a director, I might say, okay, here's here are my thoughts, here are my intentions, but I'm not going to I'm not going to be didactic about it. I'm not going to tell you exactly what I want you. I'm going to leave some openings for you to interpret. Okay, well, this could be except or this could be except. I, I don't know that that's a bad thing because I think when you're, I, I would be more upset if he was totally didactic about <laughs> this is the only way to read this film. And if you don't read it this way, then you've missed mm. my whole point. It's kind of subjective, I guess. Like if you, I kind of feel this is like a puzzle. It's like, here are these puzzle pieces. You got to put the puzzle together. And so when you have a puzzle and you've got like two pieces that you can't find and there's just those holes there, it's like so frustrating. Whereas I feel like a director like Christopher Nolan kind of like, if you go back, you can see all the little hints kind of like left through the crumbs throughout the film and you can put the puzzle together and it feels satisfying. Whereas when it's not put together at the end, it is a bit like, is it possible oh. though? And I don't, I don't know this cause I haven't seen it this many times either, but I think you're, th you're thinking of, um, Memento. Yeah. And how many times have you seen that? 25 or 30. Yeah. <laughs> so Fair on enough. second viewing, is it possible that we've missed some, some For pieces? Sure. For sure. Um, the other thing is her, well, her friend does say something eventually, I think. Doesn't she like, I think she says, are you okay? Or something like that at the end. Because I was going to say, if you're reading it as just in her mind, is it possible that we're still seeing Harper's mm. view of the world? Because her friend doesn't say anything yet. I don't buy that. I'm just throwing it out there. Because I think we are seeing the legit view of the world. Because we're seeing it from a third person perspective, looking at Harper. Mm -hmm. And, and the fact know. that all the men look the same is maybe for the audience. And that's not what she's actually seeing. Well, that, that was the other takeaway that I had from it was, is this possibly just what she sees is that she's overlaying. Well, this is just another man. And I think it would have been too on the nose to have James's face on every character. Yeah. Whereas, when you have Rory Kinnear and, and we haven't really talked about the performances. I mean, they're both outstanding. I mean, they Harper uh, carries the movie. Uh, it's sorry. I can't remember. Uh, do you have it here? Uh, Jesse Buckley. That's right. Um, I've seen Rory Kinnear in a few things and we've talked about his, his penny dreadful performance. Technically I think the film is amazing. Like the performance is really good. The cinematography is great. The use yeah. of colors, the, the soundtrack is beautiful. Like even when she's singing, and then they make that Absolutely. into the soundtrack yeah. later on is really cool. On a technical level, I have no complaints. It's more the and this is what some people said. Level. I recall this being a similar criticism to Annihilation. Yes, um, performances were great, technically sound, all the rest of it, but it just didn't come together for. And <laughs> then I you really get to the like birthing that orgy, and you're like, oh, yeah. what's going on here? <laughs> I mean, like you said, I think this this um, is closest to his uh, Annihilation film because there are elements in that where it's like. I gave my head a shake going, whoa, hey, whoa, hey, wait, whoa. Because uh, I've seen that, I think, three or four times. See, I only saw it once and I didn't love it, but I wonder if I should go back and watch it multiple times like this one. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he is a director that you gain from multiple viewings and you start to fill in. And he gives you so much to work with, like so much to think about, so much to grapple with that I think it pays off if you... And that I would I would argue that this is almost a misnomer as a, as a horror film because, I mean, you know, Grant... He talked about that too. There's, there's no real jump scares. I mean, arguably the end is horrific <laughs> and there are well, elements she's being chased around the house. Yes. There's a few. Yeah. But I mean, the naked dude in the field, that's pretty terrifying. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I wouldn't even go there. Um, did you have any, what, did you have any critiques of the film as a movie? Like if we put all the theme and metaphor aside, just in terms of what you thought of it as a film. You know, I, I'm kind of on board with you that I feel like maybe there was some like so much going on that it became hard to like keep maybe some overlapping themes separate. 
Um, but that didn't really bother me because it gave you more to puzzle with when yeah. you when you walked away from it. But if there was something, then I then I guess I could say that. But uh, no, like I I didn't walk away. I mean, the birthing scene was horrific, and maybe that was so that that was the part that kind of lost me. Like I was with yeah. the film until yeah. that point, and then all of a sudden it's like plot twist and what is going on yeah, and totally. it, it just got weirder and weirder yeah I, there's that classic like you know if a, if a gun appears early on the gun has to go off and and the axe was referenced and i think she grabbed the axe at the mm-hmm. end i think but mm-hmm. then never oh, used it so that you could consider that as a flaw like that weapon had to be mm. used but from that classical plots perspective but did you guys see mother with I jennifer thought, lawrence i started it and i never finished it. i couldn't i there's something about it that didn't grab me and i couldn't finish it so I think the problem with this film is because it, you have to watch it as a metaphor. You can't just sit down on, on a Friday night and like, hey, let's watch Men. And it no. doesn't really function as a film on its own because the birthing thing gets so crazy that yeah. for your average viewer, it's a great puzzle. And if you want to take a couple days and really sit down and grapple with it and Agreed. think through it, it's a very rich experience. But as a as as you say, a horror film for someone just to sit down and watch, like that's why I was curious to hear. Um, Grant's perspective, someone who's not really going in with an analytical mindset, but just, hey, let's watch this movie and see how it lands. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think, did he enjoy it in the end? No. No, yeah. (laughs) I think that's why most people, like, you have to go in with the mindset of, like, I'm going to be interacting, like, with a piece of art or literature here. This is not, like, for entertainment purposes. And my understanding of Mother, it's the exact same thing. The whole film is a metaphor. You can't watch it as a film, really. Mm -hmm. And I think that, so that, for me, the difference was, I, we, we weren't, we weren't going to be looking at Mother I didn't endure it and watch it to the end because I I knew right away. I was like, okay, there's stuff going on here. I don't know if I want to dig that deep for this one. Whereas with, with this one, there were certainly elements of a traditional film that captured me at the beginning. And then it starts to get a little weirder when you notice that the characters are like the men's faces are the same, even though they're different characters. And I didn't even just, notice that. So I feel really dumb. <laughs> you guys the same person? I did not notice that. No. Nope. Oh, wow. Huh. <laughs> uh, maybe. I, and, and to be fair, maybe it was just because I knew that concept. Like when I, I'd seen the trailer months and months ago mm-hmm. and I saw um, Rory Kinnear's face on all these characters. I'm like, oh, that's super interesting. I mean, I they actually do a pretty good job it. of making them look like different yeah. people, though. I would say the only one that took me out is the the kids' the face. The boy? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. that, that looks kind of CG and weird. But every other character in there is like, oh, okay, I can see that. Yeah, like, did you, you notice the boy? No, I oh. didn't pay attention to that. Oh, fair enough. Funny, now it makes me want to watch it again, actually. So would you prefer your social commentary to be in a movie that can be experienced as a narrative, a basic narrative and a film, and not be you have to be so metaphorical, or is it just different strokes for different folks? Like something like Promising Young Woman or even like Revenge or Black Christmas, I think has that same message, but you can still enjoy it as a film. Because so many people, I'm sure, watch this, get to the birth scene and turn it off or are like, no. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he definitely takes it to the nth degree. I don't know. That's arguable because on the one hand, I, I'll i agree with you that it's more digestible if it's more surface and you could sit down and watch it. I was thinking about even the ones we did. Uh, well, like dash cam. What's the one that I, I was on my top 10? Oh, like Deadstream? Ca- Deadstream. That's definitely got social commentary, but it's it's bouncing along on a movie level and like it, it's kind of dips its toe into the social commentary, but it's really up here. Yeah. This one takes a deep, deep dive. And if your goal is you want to convey an important social message, then by just discombobulating your audience and maybe even turning them off from the beginning by calling it men, are you actually like contradict or working against your intent? Okay. Well, so again, to be devil's advocate. Yeah. So do you have to spoon feed your audience then? Like, is it wrong for well, him to go? <laughs> this is the furthest extreme from spoon feeding, yeah, but so, yes. So maybe, maybe somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I mean, it's arguable. Sure. But maybe he's saying, well, no, I'm not going to be that digestible film. I'm going to make you work for it. Like, yes, I want you to get this, but I want you to think about it and I want you to work to get it. Medium rare with a fork and knife, maybe <laughs> like somewhere in the middle. <laughs> it's still pretty accessible. Like I, I do not have a strong religious background and yet all of the religious allegory that's present, like you can pick up on yeah, it. For sure. Yeah. It's, some of it is kind of spoon feeding the apple tree, the falling of the yeah, apples, like yeah. her husband dies by it's falling. True. So there's a lot that's uh, low hanging fruit, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and the dandelions. Um, yes. I, yeah, I so didn't, I didn't get that. that. No. Sorry. So my understanding is that they can produce 
Oh, asexually? Yes. Ah, uh, interesting. Um, it just so dawned I, on me like, oh, I wonder if that's okay. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> do we, so maybe it's, do we need men? Maybe. Yeah, that's a good maybe question. you just like. It should be like dandelions. Have a major sperm bank and get rid of them all. And then you can just go on forever. It doesn't want to go to our mouth at one point. Like literally the, there's the scene where they're all flowing. Yeah. And she opens her mouth and like one goes in. I don't know what that means, but. Oh, oh. that's right. That's, um. Yeah, what part is that? She's in the house and a bunch of them kind of yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I'm not trying to make a sexual joke. I'm serious. No, no, and, and because I, I it's it, uh it slows down at that point. Yes. Yes, I remember that scene. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, I don't know. Uh I, cuz I did notice the second viewing. It was like I know there's something with the dandelion because he slowed everything down. Right. He's got some stuff going on, but I couldn't figure out what it was. It's your point. I mean, I think you could probably watch this movie 10 times and discover new things each time. Yeah. Because even the second watch was a very different experience. Mm-hmm. Well, at the end, she's holding something in her fingers. I think, isn't it green? When she's sitting there and her friend sees oh, yeah. her, she's kind of twirling a little. I, think I don't know it if it's a green. clover yeah, or yeah. something in her finger. In her finger, So that could even be some kind of, I don't know something symbolic for the green man who knows so to wrap up do people want to each go around and just give your final thoughts and ratings and whether you recommend this film to our viewers listeners oh we actually have viewers today i was just thinking i think we've hit on the big stuff like i think we could probably you know stretch this out for another hour but i think we've hit on a lot of the big things for me having seen this recently like within the last few weeks two times i think if you are coming into it as a casual viewer and you're first of all it's horror adjacent. This isn't a Friday night horror film with popcorn. Like if you're not willing to dig in and think about it, you're going to be turned off. Like if you You want to throw up your popcorn during the birthing scenes. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you're, if you want to sit down on a Friday night with your popcorn and be entertained, I don't think this is the film. I think if you're interested in film craft, in acting craft, in uh, writing and allegory and all those kinds of things, then you might approach this and say, yeah, this is really interesting. This is a puzzle. This is going to make me think. This is going to make me uh, work. And sometimes I like movies and books like that. And sometimes I just want a page turner that's really a pop fiction or a pop movie. So I think it depends on how you come into it. I would recommend it, particularly if you've liked some of Garland's other works. I think it fits in with his overall um, filmography. Um, so, so I recommend it, but only if you're willing to do the work. Mm-hmm. Jen? Yeah, I think uh, reiterating a lot of what Lee said, I think it's not one that you turn your brain off for. So yeah. if you know that going in and that interests you, it is. It's like a piece of literature and looking for decoding things and, and why they're in there. Um, and I think it leads to good good conversation. Like Grant did not go in with that kind of mindset, but we even like conversed about it after mm-hmm. and it, it left us talking and wondering about things. So um, it's actually, I I do not re-watch movies typically, but I would watch this one again just to pick up on on scenes I missed the first time around. So recommended but not for entertainment's sake (laughs) yeah good point yeah i think on a technical level the film is brilliant i think everything about it from a film craft perspective is amazing and yeah as you both say like it's just i feel like with literature you know when you're going to be reading a chunky piece of literature um whereas with a film like you and i just kind of go down a list and like okay men got this rating Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be good so it would almost be nice to know that this is a movie you have to go into with a particular lens um because I think you and I were almost willing to kind of dismiss this film the first time we watched it. Um, so yeah, if you like to think really hard and you like to do like, think of this film almost as a puzzle and you like putting that those pieces together, I think it's a very rich experience and a very good film. But yeah, would I recommend this to like your average movie go or yeah. no? Like I think this is for a very niche audience who wants to like put in the time. And I think it's one you have to watch multiple times. So on a tactical level, I think it's amazing. I think... I do think he overreaches a little bit. I'm not sure it does all come together, yeah, that's but fair. I still appreciate the effort and it was kind of fun to actually puzzle through all these different things and try and put it together. And I thought that the discussion today was really fun. So I appreciate a film that can do that because Willie's Wonderland is not going to give you that experience. So uh, I w- would like to thank our guests today, Jen. Thank Woo. you for having me. This is really uh, fun. And particularly because of course you, you can't see this. Even on video, you can't see this because the windows are blacked out. But they 
Mike and Jen uh, braved the storm of 22, um, <laughs> slipping and sliding to get here today. In my Prius. In, in, in the <laughs> Prius. Toyota plug. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to Jen. It just makes me want to have Jen again and have other guests because it makes the conversation that much more engaging. When you don't have to talk to me the whole time. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. I was trying to be nice and not say that, but that's exactly what I was I'm thinking. I can see it <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Dudes of the Dead podcast and we'll, we'll see you in the aisles. aisles. Thanks so much for listening to Dudes of the Dead podcast, where Maniac Mike and Leatherface Lee break down their latest horror movie recommendations. The show is researched, written, and hosted by Mike Vincent and Lee Nice. Produced and edited by Lee Nice. Special thanks to Aaron Jabs for the outro music. This has been a Nicely Done podcast production. <laughs>